so good morning uh, everyone and uh, it's correct uh, on time now thank you for registering for this webinar and uh, we hope you all uh, have a nice insight into mems uh, i would also like to welcome my uh, colleague uh, dr ramse salim he is from tindal and uh, we both are from euro practice and i'll be the host for you today and uh, dr ramse will be the co-host so please feel free to post all your questions in the uh, q and a box and we'll take up the questions one by one at, at the end of the webinar so let's start and uh, yeah so good morning again and i'm dr veda sandeep nagraja and uh, i am from uh, tindal national institute uh, ireland and uh, here i am um, uh, your host for the webinar series it starts today and it ends on the 5th of may and these are the list of webinars that we have planned up for you today we'll be introducing you to the mems concepts and the applications so um the topic is very generic and we'll be taking you through all the applications so this is the flow that i would like to have i'll introduce you to mems take you through a history of how mems got evolved from cmos various industry applications the um, actuation and sensing mechanism go down to fabrication take some few case studies of challenges in fabrication then how we go about packaging and then introduce you to the various mem service we have from euro practice platform uh, that will be uh, the flow of my talk so let's uh, get into the world of mems so mems the word uh, the abbreviation when you see the full form it stands for micro electro mechanical system so as the name suggests uh, it has two domains basically the electric domain and the mechanical domain and in each of these domains we have certain parameters which we consider very important for the design of these devices in the electrical domain uh, for example we we are bothered about the voltage charge capacitance current and so on to name a few and in the mechanical domain we have pressure force acceleration displacement and so on so the coupling of these two domains makes the device work the way it does and uh, the typical dimensions uh, go up to 100 microns but if you include the io pads and uh, some of the devices itself per se go into the millimeter range as well so it's not typically only micro dimension we go up to millimeter in fact when i'm talking to you today um, there is a mems uh, couple of mems devices which are coming into picture uh, by which you are able to get my acoustic signal which is a mems microphone that's embedded in our systems so let's see the history and it all began when the first integrated circuit came into existence in 1958 ti came up with the first ic and it evolved from there because uh, moore uh, who uh, made an observation and he came up with a law called moore's law and he said that every 18 months the the number of transistor that were getting embedded into a square inch of uh, silicon was getting doubled so how could the sensors and actuators not fit into that miniaturized scale so there was a need to miniaturize and that's why uh, the evolution happened and then in 1959 uh, feynman gave that uh, very famous talk um, plenty of room at the bottom and he speared uh, the revolution in nanotechnology and researchers started looking at miniaturizing not just the transistors many other devices and it was in 1965 that dr nathanson from pittsburgh he came up with the first mems uh, device which was actually a tuner for a radio a mic, uh, miniaturized radio came up with a tuner and it looked like this so that's the history so most of the mems devices came up from the same technology as cmos so it's very compatible with cmos so let's see where mems um, gets into and who are the leaders in industry who are into the mems domain and these are only some applications that i put up in fact i always say that imagination is the limit where you can use these devices so texas instrument lucent technology they are big leaders in um, digital micromiller devices so these devices go into your projector system dlp projectors where you are trying to tilt a, a, a mirror a micro mirror using micro actuators and thereby come up with some beautiful images that you see on your screen 
Then analog devices um, uh, play a big role in the accelerometer market. And uh, these accelerometers are very common in automotive application. In fact, when you have this airbag deployment system built in your automobile, which basically senses the sudden deceleration that happens, that's an actually an accelerometer. Also, if you want to sense the pressure in the tire of your car or your vehicle, uh, there is a MEMS, uh, pressure sensor out there. So actually the cost of the automobile increases with more number of such devices put into them. The next industry leader that I put up here is, uh, is Bosch. And um, we are all today conscious about our health and we want to know the number of footsteps we have every day, the heart points or your pulse rate, uh, the calories burned. So all these wearable electronics have MEM sensor built in them. And Bosch is a very big leader out there who go into the smartphones, who build sensors for the smartphones and wearable electronics. But very uh, uh, early uh, industry leaders were HP, and they were first of, uh, the first to come up with a commercial product, the inject uh, printer, which, about which the principle of its working is what I will be explaining in the next few slides. But they were one of the early people who brought out um, a commercial MEMS device. So let's look at the market share of some of these industry players uh, as well. So um, these are the MEMS uh, industry leaders. They have, there are SST microelectronics and analog devices, as I said. There is Broadcom who, who has come uh, uh, about very uh, recently. They, have, they hold a very big market share, NXP. Some of them are in the RF uh, domain. So RF MEMS is coming up very fast and it's catching up in the market. So if you see their market share, you can see that few years back, Broadcom was not having a huge share, but today they, they are one of the global leaders. Um, ST Microelectronics, Bosch, they all have their own market. Each one has its, his own product and uh, each of these products has its own niche application and they all fit into this uh, space. Other than these world leaders and industry leaders, there are many SMEs and startups also coming into picture. And we from Europractice would like to uh, provide services, not just to researchers in academics, we also try to provide services to um, SMEs. So let's get into some um, hardcore uh, MEMS uh, principles. So let's look at the actuation and sensing mechanism. The first one is and most commonly used is capacitive. Uh, the reason for it being very common is because it's least expensive as it is compa uh, comparable, its fabrication uh, procedure is comparable or it fits into the CMOS fabrication process line. So it, let's see this um, mechanism. So if we have two parallel plate capacitors and let's say we have some way of actuating one of the plates and if one of the plates moves uh, uh, in the vertical direction, there will be a change in the distance between the two plates and that's where you get the change in capacitance. Or let's say there is some way of moving this plate laterally in the uh, X direction and uh, you know, then there is change in the overlap area between these two plates and again, you get a change in your capacitance. There is one more way if you have a method of changing the dielectric constant, and this can be if you try to immerse them, let's say in a liquid at a certain uh, level, then there is change in dielectric constant and that's how the change in capacitance happens. This uh, capacitive uh, actuation or sensing mechanism is very commonly used in the comb drive structure. So let's say this is an accelerometer and if this mass is made to move due to certain acceleration, and if if we consider uh, one pair of this tooth to be one capacitor, then all of them add up in parallel, you get a good sensitivity. And if, they, if this mass is made to move, let's say in the vertical direction, then there will be change in the overlap area and thereby change in capacitance. And this is further taken for signal processing and we get the sensing or actuation uh, reading. The next one that I would like to uh, introduce you is the thermal domain. So this is actually a thermal actuator. So uh, if I apply some actuation voltage here, then there will be uh, some current flowing through this. And we know when current flows, there is heat induced. And this heat can actually, depending on what kind of material this is made up of, it can have a bending action towards the wider arm. So the thinner arm 
uh, uh, actually fluctuates, it moves, it bends more than the wider arm, and this is how the actuation happens. And uh, this is a reversible phenomena. So if you remove back the applied voltage, it will come back to its original position. So this is an actuator, it works like a switch, and uh, it's in the thermal domain because of thermal coefficient of expansion. That particular coefficient is very significant for the material here. And the third mechanism that I would like to introduce uh, y'all is the piezoelectric domain. Um, and uh, we from Tyndall uh, work on uh, piezo MEMS and, uh, and we are ready to take uh, questions on this as well, if you have any queries on this. Basically, uh, this has a smart material called as a piezoelectric material. And here what happens is that we, when we apply let's say a mechanical stress, there is direct piezoelectric effect and it, it will induce some charges on this, on this piezoelectric material and thereby uh, it's like mechanical to electrical conversion. On the contrary, there is another mechanism where you can have inverse piezoelectric effect and you can have an actuation voltage, create a mechanical stress and make the membrane vibrate. So that is from electrical domain to mechanical domain conversion. And uh, these piezoelectric materials are uh, used in energy harvesting applications a lot because it does not require an external bias. Um, now, having seen the different actuation and sensing mechanism, I would not say that these are the only mechanism. There are other mechanisms. There is piezoresistive, there is electrostatic and so on. I'm not covered them, but they do exist in the market. Now let's look at classifying the MEMS uh, devices. They're broadly classified into two categories. One is the sensor, the other one is the actuator. Now I'll take you through some examples of these. Uh, so as a sensor, uh, let's say you have an accelerometer here and these accelerometers uh, can be used in a variety of applications. So um, they can be used as a vibration sensor. Let's say you have um, a civil structure uh, let's say a bridge and you want to continuously monitor its health, the beams of these bridges, which are underground or underwater, you can't go physically and monitor them. So you can embed these kind of sensors there, which wirelessly transmit the data and you can monitor its health. Basically what it does is it finds out whether the resonant frequency is constantly the same, but if there are cracks developed, then it will give a shift in the resonant frequency and thereby you can say, that there is some problem. It can be used even for engine health monitoring and so on. So there are plenty of applications of accelerometer other than the automotive examples that I gave you. Then we have um, what I said, the uh, inkjet printer, which uh, HP came about very in, during the early stages of MEMS evolution. So here what happens is basically it is like a pressure sensor. A pressure is created by actuating uh, the, the PZT actuator on the diaphragm. So when this uh, diaphragm is uh, subjected to external pressure using a PZT actuator, it uses the inverse piezoelectric effect. This cavity, which has the ink will be induced with sufficient pressure, which will open the valve, which is the nozzle of the inkjet printer, and it ejects out the uh, droplets of ink and then the printing happens. So this is all at micro scale. And this can be controlled by uh, using a, a pulse signal for actuating these diaphragms. So it is basically nothing but a pressure sensor that is embedded, but it is actuated using. So it's an actuator and a sensor combination. And the third example that I would like to put up here is, uh, which is very common today, in, thanks to the pandemic, all of us know about PCR testing. PCR um, stands for polymerase chain reaction. So here what happens is it's not a freestanding structure of MEMS. So people don't categorize this as common MEMS devices, but uh, it is a miniaturized device. It has a microheater, as you can see here. So these microheaters are actually integrated with microfluidic channel in this application. So when you're putting some bio sample, let's say your saliva or any other sample, it enters the microfluidic channels and it is made to pass through these microheaters these microheaters will have temperature gradient. So what happens is uh, your DNA sample, which will exist, this DNA uh, double strands will get split into individual templates and each template is made to amplify. So there is a temperature gradient maintained and that microheater comes into uh, play for uh, uh, splitting this DNA sample and amplifying it further. 
And uh, this is actually an integrated device with microfluidic channels. Next, coming to the actuators. Um, so if you can see here, uh, this is nothing but uh, the actuator, the thermal actuator, which I explained. So you can see we have applied some bias and the actuation happens because the current is flowing from the thinner arm towards the thicker arm. And uh, one more actuator example I would give here is that of a switch. So you have this membrane and this membrane will actually uh, have a pull-in voltage, pull-in effect when you apply voltage between this membrane, which also will be either a semiconductor or a conductor between this membrane and the signal plane. If you apply voltage more than the pull-in voltage, or more than what we call as a threshold voltage, the membrane will try and bend and try to touch the bottom electrode. But if it touches the bottom electrode, there are chances of the device collapsing. So we have an oxide built here. And this is a reverse phenomena. Its curve will look very similar uh, to that of hysteresis curve that we know. I will be dealing with the issues of the switch in my later case studies slides. So this is about the switch. Um, that's also an actuator example. Then we have the micro mirror, which I explained uh, during the Texas Instruments and Lucent Technology example. So here we have a micro mirror, which is actually a MEMS device. It is getting tilted by actuators, the torsional beams, which exist below it at certain angles so that you get a clear image. So now we have seen the classification of MEMS, but there is one particular uh, domain that I'm not touched upon. This is per se not MEMS because it does not have the electrical domain coupled here, but this is a micro optomechanical sensors where you're trying to sense a mechanical parameter, but using the optic domain. So this is from, uh, this is a product that has come up from one of the Europe practice partners, IMEC. So what we have here is basically a membrane uh, which gets uh, deformed because of differential pressure. There is a pressure from the top as well as from the bottom. And uh, because of this differential pressure that is uh, existing here, the, the membrane will deform. And if you have some optical rays falling on this membrane, at the detector, there will be phase change of these optical signal and the detector uh, senses this phase change, thereby it can sense the pressure that was induced on this membrane. So it is from mechanical domain, which is the pressure, and you're sensing it in the optical domain. That's a phase change in the optic signal. There is no electrical domain here. They have got very good results from this and it's commercialized. So to improvise this design, they took up a ring resonator structure. So on the membrane, they have the ring resonator, which uses the uh, MZI uh, interferometer phenomena. So here, basically, what they have done is they have used a laser source, a beam splitter. It gets into this ring resonator structure and there is a optical interference because of which there will be phase change in the signals. And that is being detected at the detector using this uh, MMI combiner. And it's very precise in its result. They've got high precision uh, devices coming out of this. So this is one uh, other part, one another miniaturized sensor that exists out there. So now we have seen the applications. We have seen the actuation mechanism and the types of sensors. Let's look at the fabrication. So fabrication can be split into two halves. One half, which you see um, the flow chart here, it's basically very compatible with the CMOS fabrication process flow. And the next one, which I'll cover, will be more so for the MEMS devices. So whenever we want to start any fabrication, we take the wafer and uh, that comes from the vendor. And irrespective of um, from where it comes, every fab has its own procedure of cleaning it. So wafer cleaning is the first step and uh, it, it uses certain chemicals depending on what kind of uh, wafer cleaning procedure you adapt in your fab line. Now, having got a clean wafer, we have to deposit different layers. And this deposition can be done using different methods, again, depending on what type of layer you want to deposit. So there are uh, mechanisms which use uh, plasma field. In plasma environment, basically, they deposit. Some do not require the plasma setup and it all depends uh, what's the thickness, what material and so on. Some common deposition mechanisms or methodologies I have listed here. It's a chemical vapor deposition, sputtering, evaporation, there is pin coating and so on. 
Now you have deposited a layer, let's say, and now you want to pattern it to uh, your requirement. That's a device application requirement. And the common method that is used for um, patterning is the lithography. Again, there are types of lithography depending on the minimum feature size you want to have. And to do lithography or to do the resist coating, again, resist coating is done by spin coating mechanism. Now, uh, let's assume you have done the lithography, you have patterned it. Now you have to remove the unwanted material and that process is called the etching procedure. So etching procedure is uh, done again using different mechanisms, dry wetch, reactive ion etching or deep reactive ion etching. All this, how do you choose which method to use depends on again on what kind of substrate, what kind of material you want to etch out. And uh, it's, a, um, it's a very important step because we want only the unwanted part to be etched out. We do not want the device layer to be uh, harmed or damaged in this whole process. The next uh, step is uh, optional. So till now, whatever I explain is to be done for every layer of the device that you want to fabricate or you want to have it in your device stack. It has to be done. The next step that I'm going to say is not compatible with the CMOS process and it is not really required always even in the MEMS field, but it is there as an option, which is the wafer bonding uh, process. So wafer bonding is required when in a particular device, let's say you want to have a different layers which are on two different substrates. Let's say one is on a glass substrate, another one is on a silicon substrate and you want to attach them. You want to bond them together so that's when you go for wafer bonding. And uh, this happens um, because there are certain niche application who require it. There are different methods again of doing wafer bonding. There's direct bonding, eutatic bonding um, and so on. So you have to choose a particular method of doing this. Now, this is the first part of the fabrication and uh, it's very, people who are from CMOS background can relate to this much. The next part is more so for uh, the MEMS um, fabrication process. So if this is, let's say your wafer, each one of the square, square box that you see out here is actually a die. So you have to, if you want the devices to work individually, then you have to dice them and cut out your space of the device. So that procedure of removing out each one of the square or cutting it out is called as the dicing. So dicing, can be done in different ways. There are many methods of doing. It's a very uh, critical uh, procedure and, and uh, can be uh, harmful for the release structure because it releases a lot of impurities or debris. So a lot of care has to be taken when you do the dicing. Uh, I'll be coming up with the challenges of each of these steps in my later slide as well. Having got your diced die now, you have to attach it. So die attach is nothing but you, you will have some uh, standard packaging setups or units in which you need to now take these dies and place them, carefully handle these dies because you, you, know, you should not be damaging the release structures. So uh, carefully handling at the corners, not from the top, and then go and place it on the die attach, which are standard packaging units, and then take out the leads is very critical step. So usually, as I said, the dicing and die attach are very um, difficult to handle. It can um, create damage. So what they do is they encapsulate these devices during this process and the release edge is taken after that so that you know the devices um, uh, encapsulations and uh, are removed and now you have a released uh, device that comes out. So release edge happens after you do the die attach. And finally, you package it so packaging, again, depends on what kind of application you, are, you want to use your sensor for. Uh, you, have, you might need hermetic sealing or you might not need. If it is an RF device, then it's a total different ball game uh, to do the packaging. So um, I would say that you have to be very careful when you're packaging. You have to understand the application and then go about. Now, finally, the package device is also tested for its functionality. So this is the complete flow that we have for fabrication. So when we look holistically at MEMS fabrication, we can divide them into two categories. The first one is bulk micro machining, which I will be explaining now. So bulk is nothing but an, uh, an, another name for substrate. 
And uh, let's take an example of a building a, or developing a pressure sensor. So I have the silicon substrate, which is nothing but my bulk. And depending on my application, I might need to dope it. So I will dope it, let's say, with silicon and make it more conductive in nature. Now I need to create a cavity to make it a pressure sensor. So I will uh, make it uh, undergo lithography procedure. We'll pattern it by coating a photoresist, uh, exposing it to UV. And then, yes, what do we have? We have the release structure. So what has happened in this whole thing is the bulk, which is nothing but the substrate, has got etched out, has got uh, sacrificed in, in, in other words. You know, so the sacrificial layer here is nothing but the substrate by itself. So that's why it's called as bulk micro machining. But the photoresist remains. So finally, we etch out the photoresist and you get your device. So here in bulk micro machine, it's the substrate, which is the sacrificial layer. The other method is we don't sacrifice the substrate, but we sacrifice some other layer. So that is surface micro machining. So let's again look at a pressure sensor, but using a cantilever. So what we have, again, it's the substrate. I take silicon and first thing I'll do is I'll coat a sacrificial layer throughout it. This sacrificial layer can be in uh, different kinds of materials exist. It can be an oxide, silicon oxide. It can be silicon nitride, polysilicon, some other polynomial. It, it depends on what your process step is, what application and so on. So I will coat it completely initially. Then I will pattern it for a particular opening so that I can have my device structure built. After this step, I uh, deposit my device layer and uh, pattern it um, uh, as per the application. So I have the device layer coated. Then what I do is I etch out the sacrificial layer. So as you can see here, it's very clear that the substrate is not sacrificed. It is the intermediate layer, which is finely etched out, which makes us release the structure. And this comes out as a freestanding cantilever structure, which can work even as a pressure sensor. Now, care has to be taken that when you're releasing the structure, a lot of opt optimization has to take place. Otherwise, this device can break. It's not easy to release these structures. And that's where I'll be taking you next towards the challenges that exist when you are trying to fabricate these devices. So I'll have, I have some case studies for you, very interesting case studies for you. So for all the case studies, I would like to acknowledge the Tyndall PISOMEMS team and they have uh, shared their uh, challenges, in fact, that uh, come during uh, their fabrication procedures. So this is one cantilever structure. We actually want the device to look like this finally, right? Three standing structure. But during the initial runs, as I said, when they tried to release the structure, due to the residual stress, it will bend and finally, it might even break. So there can be breakdown, fatigue, creep, or fracture, and the device can fail. So a lot of reliability steps have to be uh, put in place. You have to uh, test them for these reliability issues, have process uh, stress compensation mechanism in the fabrication. A lot of iteration of fabrication has to be done before you really get a good device out there. So, so this is one of the challenges that we have for getting out a released uh, freestanding structure. The next uh, case study that I have here is that of an energy harvester. So what we ha have here is basically um, a huge cantilever. And uh, beneath, beneath this mass, uh, we have a magnet, which is energized by a wire carrying an AC current. So when AC current flows, as we know, the magnet gets energized and that will actually actuate this cantilever. It makes it move up and down and there is stress created at the fixed end. So at the fixed end, where there's going to be maximum stress or strain created, that's where we put the piezo layer, the piezo patch. And there the charges get accumulated and we capture them in a piezo capacitor and the power can be generated from that. So this is what we want. But what was observed was that depending on the load on this mass, there was nonlinear performance of the device. So as the load increased, the power generated was also decrease, decreasing. And this was like a nonlinear phenomena and this has to be avoided. So again, a lot of iterations and optimization in the fabrications are taken so that we overcome this problem that at a particular resonance, it should not be dependent on load and you should be able to get the required kind of power generated. 
The next case study that I have for you all here is that of um, basically in the packaging field. So what we have here is a beam. It's a fixed, fixed beam on either side, and it's a resonator. So uh, what we do for resonator usually is we have thin film encapsulation, and we try to seal it hermetically. So we want hermetic sealing to happen, but there are chances that during the packaging um, encapsulation procedure in fabrication, there can be leakages, and that leakage can actually shift the resonant frequency of this beam. And that's what you observe here. So when there was leakage, there was change in the uh, resonant frequency, and this is not desirable. And so we should be very careful when we are doing this thin film encapsulation. This is a structure which is used for characterizing and getting the frequency response. Then other case study that I have is what I explained, the pull-in voltage. So as I said, uh, it's a parallel plate capacitor. You apply this voltage greater than the pull-in voltage, it should actuate and touch like this. But what was observed during this fabrication was the pull-in voltage gets shifted. So you can see the dotted lines here. That means there was shift in the pull-in voltage. And this was observed over a period of time. So over a period of time, as you uh, see here, there was shift in the pull-in voltage, and this is not desirable. We want it to be a reliable switch for at least n number of uh, actuation runs. And this, is, this could be, the reason for this shift in the pull-in voltage could be because the dielectric was getting charged which is not desirable, or there was me mechanical non-reliability of the membrane itself. So the design needed to be changed. So a lot of optimization took place to see that finally the switch works without a shift. Then, uh, then came that uh, we had one customer who wanted basically uh, a membrane which had perforations. So these perforations required to be of a certain dimension. We didn't want the dimension to be varying. And uh, it was basically to eject out some droplets. So what we found uh, was very surprising because in the first run, the customer requirements were met. We could get the required dimension. But subsequently, the next run, when we fabricated the same structure, we, we found that there were the holes, the etched holes were of different dimensions. Not just that, instead of circular holes, we ended up getting rectangular holes um, and so on. A lot of defects were found. To pinpoint why this happens is very difficult. It could be because the silicon material was defective or you had misalignment of the silicon crystal, um, uh, you know, uh, the hard mask, irregularity. There can be plenty of reasons. So again, a lot of iterations. So you have to run it many number of times to get the optimized result. Do not think that the first time you have got it, the next time you will get it. No, it doesn't happen that way. So you have to undergo a lot of iterations. Now I have taken you through uh, fabrication, types of fabrication and the challenges. Now let's come to the critical part of packaging these devices. So uh, MEMS uh, packaging and integration can be classified again into two categories. You can package them monolithically, that means on the same wafer, or you can have them integrated in a multi-chip module. So in a monolithic packaging, you have two types again. First one is CMOS first, where on, on the single wafer, on the same wafer, first you fabricate the CMOS circuitry, that is the electronics, then you passivate it, and on the same wafer, later you can fabricate your MEMS device. Or some of them actually fabricate their MEMS device first, but they will not release the structure. They will passivate it, protect it, and then have the electronics circuitry fabricated, then finally come back and release the MEMS structure. So this is on the same wafer you're trying to do the integration of your electronics as well as MEMS devices. What is to be remembered here is that MEMS devices need to be integrated with electronics to make it work in a, at a system level. And MEMS devices also get connected with many other micro uh, devices like microfluidic channels, which I gave you as an example, or with a photonic device per se. And in Euro practice, we try to help you with system integration as well. And, but the most common method 
of uh, integrating uh, or packaging a MEMS device with electronics is using the multi-chip module where you have devices fabricated on different wafers and you take them on a PCB and then wire bond and use some other mechanisms to make it a system. Please remember that the cost of a MEMS system is more so because of the packaging cost. 80 to 90% of the cost comes from packaging. The device cost is really much, much lesser. So some challenges that exist during the MEMS fabrication and packaging are when we try to do some release etch or drying, there can be stiction. Stiction is basically when two layers will adhere to each other, there can be stiction. This could be because of the etchants that we use, the OH groups that exist, and they can cause the residual stress. To overcome this, uh, uh, there are some possible solutions. They use freeze drying or critical drying, but very commonly they use dimples in the structure itself to overcome this um, uh, stiction phenomena that uh, comes because of the fabrication etching process. And as I told, dicing can be very critical. It can create a lot of contamination. So usually they use uh, wafer level encapsulation so that the device did not get uh, uh, contaminated during this process. Also die handling has to be done very carefully. You should never do it on a, from the top. You should do it at the side. If your fab is actually a automated fab, then make sure that the handling of these dies are at the sides and not from the top, as you see in the CMOS technology. Also, stresses are induced when you're fabricating. So they are going with um, materials which have uh, less thermal uh, expansion coefficient, uh, which induces less stress, less modulus, die attach, and so on. Outgassing is another uh, packaging parameter, and this can create a challenge of, again, stiction, or it can corrode the device. So they are coming up with new novel materials for die attach, uh, which can overcome this problem. Finally, yes, you, you need not do only an electrical stimuli uh, testing. You need to do even non-electrical uh, testing on your devices. So usually after the uh, devices are fabricated, we do some characterization or testing at wafer level before we take it to the packaging, uh, the, uh, packaging level of the device. So I would like to now introduce you to some of the fab, uh, MEMS fab services and uh, some of the people here, some of the fab Fab lines uh, are also the services we provide from Europractice. The first one uh, is MEMSCAP, and uh, MEMSCAP is one of the world leaders. They have commercial fab lines, and Europractice provides services to MEMSCAP through, uh, through our platform. The next webinar will be on uh, MEMSCAP, and my colleague, Dr. Sambuddha Khan, will be giving you an overview on that. XFAB is another service, um, MEMS FAB service, and uh, Europractice again provides you the platform uh, under a certain uh, fab, FAB process uh, of XFAB is with us. And uh, Dr. Romano uh, of IMEC will be giving the third session of this webinar um, on XFAB. And uh, Tyndall will be very shortly entering into this uh, arena. And we will be coming up with the PISO MEMS uh, service. And uh, to know more about what we have in the offering, you will have to attend my May 5th webinar. Please register for all these webinars. Um, you have time. The next one um, will be shortly in two weeks. So please register for all these uh, so that you get an insight. And other than this, uh, we have Teledyne and Silex also as a MEMS fab service, but Europractice does not provide the, the services for these platforms. So let me introduce you now to Europractice. Uh, Europractice has been there for a couple of decades and uh, uh, we, we have been providing you access to design tools. So right from your conceptualization to productization is what we would like to take care. So we give you access to design tool, training, uh, you know, prototype uh, servicing system integration. We have been largely uh, covering Europe, the Europe market. We not only take care of uh, the academy and researchers, we are also looking for industries, electronic industry services. And now uh, also please remember, even though if you're not from Europe, it is worldwide accessible. So anyone across the globe can use Europractice uh, platform for the services that you require. So as I said, you as a customer come up with your idea. We take you through a complete business development plan. We understand your requirement. We provide you the training for it. Then we even um, help you with uh, 
uh, design spec, prototyping, and then um, finally we even help you after pro uh, prototyping if you want to upscale to volume. We are there for that as well. And these are the partners. Uh, I would acknowledge each one of the partners of Europractice, and uh, the partners are IMEC. Uh, they are from Belgium, then we have uh, CMP from France and Fraunhofer from Germany, UKRI from UK and Tyndall from Ireland. We are all the five partners and each one has been very helpful in providing these services and helpful to me personally in um, conducting this webinar. And uh, this is the list of the upcoming webinar. The next one will be on the 7th by Dr. Sambuddha Khan, my colleague from Tyndall. He will be telling you about the MUMPS process in MEMSCAT and how Euro practice uh, can be approached for this. Dr. Romano from IMEC will be giving on the 21st of April and he'll be talking about the open platform MEMS technology from XFAP. He will be giving you some example. Both of them will be giving you case studies and examples of uh, how these platforms can be used for different kinds of devices. And I'll be coming back again on the 5th of May, um, that will be to tell you what Tindal has in the future to offer. It's a piece of service. I'll be your host for all these webinars and please feel free to contact me anytime for any of your questions on either this webinar or of Euro Practice Mem service. I'll be very happy to answer you. Um, and please register for the upcoming webinar. There is still some time and um, I hope you all have the registration links. Otherwise I can provide you if you write to me. And this is the uh, website of Europractice. And uh, if you go to the MEMS link, this is what it will display. It has two foundries right now open, one MEMSCAP and one XFAP. And you could go and contact them, either CMP or IMEC for MEMSCAP or for XFAP, it's IMEC. Um, future offering from PISO MEMS will soon be here once we are ready to announce it. But I'll be giving you an overview of what is in offer. This is the link to the uh, MEMS uh, site in Europractice, please visit the website. If you have any queries um, on Europractice, you can uh, contact uh, us either by going through the contact us link here, or you could write to me, whichever is more comfortable to you, and we'll be happy to provide you the service. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the entire beautiful team that we have at uh, Tyndall. I'm um, very happy to be part of both the PISO MEMS group as well as the Europractice group at Tyndall. And I would also acknowledge and thank Dr. Romano from IMEC um, who has uh, been part of this webinar and uh, I've had serious consultations with him and helping me getting through this. And uh, that's it from me. 